This was uh, why we brought uh, people like Jack in, and enormously valuable they were to us. A, the kind of, uh, of feeling that one got Jack in a pub, he wasn't a person who uh, made any great show, any great demonstration, but he sat there quietly, very much contained within himself, and one sensed an understanding, and when he began to talk, about things. It was very different from the documentary filmmaker's approach, who tended to see perhaps too superficially in those days. And I think Jack enormously helped us to get deeper into people's true motivation, their reactions to the situation they happened to be in. It wasn't a question of writing dialogue. There was very little dialogue in our films, but selecting the instant, perhaps, in a human situation, which, if photographed, would, in a subtle kind of way, provide an insight into the character of the person shown. Jack, as a writer, I, I, quite frankly, I was astonished <laughs> when I read his scripts, because although I had read Freedom of the Streets in the 30s, and although his conversation was very enjoyable, um, the purity of his English, the vigor of his English, and the quality of his thinking behind the English made a great impression on me. I was quite uh, struck, even before Kidder's Luck, with the work he did in the film spirits. And then when he brought out, to, to everybody's surprise, Kidder's Luck, uh, this convinced me that here was a, what, a truly English writer coming from a genuinely working class background who reflected that background and yet gave it a quality of observation. His work had a quality of thought and observation which uh, made you live with it. I remember uh, how well I thought of it at the start and I still do. Um, if you want to know why, I suppose the first thing to say is that he's got what's the basis of any good book like this, and that is an extraordinary eye for detail. I'm thinking of uh, individual things, such as his observation of the particular place of Sunday afternoon in a working class home, sending the kids to Sunday school so that the, the parents can have a quiet time and in fact go to bed and make love. The heavy Sunday dinner, half a cow, greens, potatoes in Yorkshire, lashings of rice pudding to follow, which varied in detail, but not in character through all the seasons, was the crown of the day. Rightly, too, for this heap of food marked the triumph of successful parenting, the winnings of the good provider, the achievement of the good cook. When it was over, then was a time for religion, both of them. In working class circles, Sunday afternoon is traditionally sacred to the worship of Venus and the nice lie down. Perhaps one reason why the working class in general is so good-humoured and patient, charitable and unenvious is that there must have been a great deal of them conceived on the Day of Grace. But if there were just that, well, that would be useful, interesting anecdotage and not much more. I think more than that, what he brings out well are some of the main lines of working class life at that time. The second thing is the moment he gets where he's talking about playing out in the street on warmish days and playing on the pavement until dusk falls and you're called in. And what he manages to get there is a sense of quite extraordinary happiness. And that reminded me of the passage in Traherne about pure bliss in childhood where he says the corn was orient and immortal wheat. He's talking about a child in the country. But this is a child on a pavement and, and he's right of course and it isn't something that you can pin down to back lavatories and working class life, it, the being of a kid beyond the detail of Newcastle. I have one strong pavement memory which must be pretty early. Summer again and I was lying with my face close to the grey slate paving stones tracing the cracks. They were as warm as dinner plates and there was a powerful sickly smell of privet and blossom. Then drops like pennies came splashing down patterning the light summer pavement with dark discs, and faster, wetting my hands, my hair, my back, I chuckled over the lovely pennies. No doubt I was lugged to shelter soon enough and by a little girl. Yet it was one of those moments, brief and trivial in themselves, for which time's clock stops. The third thing is the one that made me laugh because I've met it too. The most neglected uh, sense uh, officially, uh, 
consciously in all our, our writing, I think, is, is the sense of smell. We, we don't often mention it. But in fact, when you're a child, or when you're writing about your own early childhood, you tend to find that you work your way through to things by your nose. You're moving with your nose down all the time, like a dog going from lamppost to lamppost. And he does exactly that. Um, you check through it and you find that what comes up sharp after page after page is the smell of cooking, the smell of his mother's dress. He even talks about the smell of women's clothes at that time, which are very long, and you could smell urine on them because of complicated reasons. She pulled her chair well into the fire, pulled up her skirts to give her knees a warm, thus showing black stockings gartered below the knee with bits of old ribbon or boot lace and black boot laced up to support the broken ankle. When her skirts warmed, they smelt of piss. This was not at all unusual among Edwardian females, by the way. I suppose ladies' lavatories were scarcer, or perhaps the long skirt of the period encouraged the easy yielding to the promptings of the bladder. Anyway, it was a frequent encounter, if you were a small boy, to come into a quiet back lane and find a lady apparently lost in thought. Her eyes surveyed the rooftops or looked without purpose into the distance. Was she listening to that muffled splashing? She certainly took no notice of the dark stream appearing under her butt. And when you came closer to see what it was, go away, boy, she'd say. He makes a friend of a boy who's rather posher. Seems incredibly posh to him because they have a fire, they have a firework display, but father sets them off. He's an only child, I remember. And they have a proper tea and so on. That rings so true. Uh, what he's doing is making his first real uh, recognition of the very complicated class graduation, uh, gradations in English life. There were no gorgeous rockets or fat Roman candles around these parts. We went in for the cheaper kinds you got more of. And many a group now were down to squibs. It didn't so much matter, so long as you had something to make you one of the crowd. There was a crowd too. Not much hope of getting the offsprings early to bed tonight. You could see even the neat toddlers solemnly lighting each other's sparklers from the hot end of the last one to burn out and there were little girls running wild as they tried to throw lit London lights into the air. Naturally, the excitement I missed at Edmunds do got me now. Uh, this, this, uh, this is a rare gift, I think. A lot of people go around uh, putting on a show about working class life, <laughs> and a lot of bad, you know, bad things happen and all the rest of it. And in fact, to my mind, they cheapen and vulgarise working class life. It was, I think, about 1953 or 4 that I first read this book, by which time I was well advanced with my own. And I remember, incidentally, being struck by the similarity in approach and even in angle of vision and so on. When my book came out, it did have a lot of success. And I think my first answer to your question would be that there's such a thing as, as the climate of the time, and that by the late 50s, for very complicated reasons, people were more ready to, to listen to this kind of inquiry. When he writes about working class life, he writes, first of all, I would say, as an educated man in the real sense of the word, that he's, uh, he's, he's able to use the English language in a flexible, honest, and um, imaginative way. And at the same time, he's able to report faithfully on life as he's uh, in his own childhood in this case, of course. And it is a great tragedy that he did nothing else. The concluding years of his life was rather full of struggle. He was busy doing scripts for the ABC people, examining as much as five books a week. Though the money was a little better for him, it was hack writing in his eyes, you know. Comparable to craftsmen washing dishes, so to speak. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Ideas about book production and book writing, you see, had to be shelved. Just didn't have the time. To get a living, you had to do, if you could get them, at least ten books a week, if not more. Most of them, of course, were very bad books, very poor, rubbishy books. Uh, your, your mind at the end of a week of this was like 
blotting paper soaking up kind of foul water <laughs> and you, you were incapable of putting down sensibly thoughts of your own. In fact, if people asked you a question like, it's a nice day, isn't it? You'd find yourself unable to grope for an answer. Kinner's look was followed by the Ampersan, but the third part of the trilogy was never completed. Yet, as the graffiti writers would put it, and in Highgate Cemetery of all places, Jack Common lives. I decided to base Karl Marx's eyebrows on the fundamental structure of Jack Common's brow. For here I found many of the human qualities that I could see in the photographs and I understood from reading the life of Karl Marx. Human sympathy, tolerance, and a profound understanding and an inexhaustible patience, for Jack had tremendous patience, both with his friends and with his own life. Well, but he had bad luck. And persisted throughout his life. Otherwise, how did he die poor man with these qualities? But most people who do recognize it have any idea of literature. Have read anything at all. What do you say can be there such an answer? At least one book, one, one thing should have made the grade if uh, he had any luck at all. He didn't. Bad luck persisted throughout, right till his death. The archangels of chance gave to me an unprofitable heredity and a stony environment. So far, I cannot claim to have experienced any exceptionally toward event which might suggest that I'm a destined child of fortune. Nevertheless, as it's high time the look of the kid has toned, that goes for all of them. I intend to live in every possible way as if it had. No doubt you'd prefer something better. Believe me, what I offer so frankly is what you're increasingly likely to get from any one of that host who might sign themselves, as I do, yours truly, W. Kidder. If you have a friend on whom you think you can rely, you are a lucky man. If you found the reason to live on and not to die, you are a lucky man.